Oh, man, I I know Cleveland Gary wore number 43, but I can't think of whether he would have played in a Super Bowl. Falconer TRX. Natty's come from the president's and trustees spending more money. I don't necessarily, well, spending money, but yeah, you know, and I think that this has come up because somebody was talking about like, I forget who it was. I saw it on social media the other day. I was being a bad employee. I was scrolling during a meeting. Um, but uh, somebody asked the question, like, what happened to Miami? And of course, all the Miami people were like, oh my God, Donna Shalala and like, the, like Tad Foot wanted to make Miami the Harvard of the South. And then Donna Shalala came in in 2000 uh, at the end of that year. Uh, by the way, because uh, my freshman year, 2001, was Tad Foote's final year before he retired. Don Shalala interviews in 2000, gets named the new university president. So she takes over in the summer of 2001 and was, you know, like notoriously spendthrift when it came to, uh, you know, athletics while running a pair of billion with a B like boy billion dollar fundraising camp capital campaigns for the university of miami so if you if you go to campus now right and you see all these new buildings and you see all these things most all of that infrastructure was fundraised by donna shalala you look at the i mean her name is on the new student center guys you know what i mean the one that's right there on the lake with the wall of glass where drake was on the second floor when we had uh game day there in 2017 right all that like there's a reason that they put her name on it. It's not because she donated a whole bunch, like literally, you know, fundraised. I think it was all, it was nay on $3 billion uh, at the end, but putting it into the Frost School of Music from which I graduated, putting it into the new university village uh, apartment complexes, putting it into the new dorm uh, that's on campus and then redoing the freshman dorms or the, the old dorms, like the one that I lived in all four and a half years, because it was 32 steps from the school of music. I can live off campus the rest of my life. Why don't I just make my life easy? I don't, you know, whatever uh, kind of things. But um, it, it, it was just well known that it was just like, yeah, we're going to be intentionally thrifty. Um, that's putting a, a very positive spin on it, but that's really where it comes from and everything. So Falconer's point um, is well-made. That like yeah, you have to spend money, and whether you want to talk about that in um, infrastructure, so like you know the new practice facility and the new football operations center or staffing, because yeah, we bought Mario up off his good job and gave him a really good number, and then also we're keeping assistance. Why? Because we're spending the money, you know. And then it's not even getting into NIL, which is money that's being spent, even though it's not necessarily from the university proper. All of those things do contribute uh, to that, uh, to winning, and hopefully we'll be able to turn those dollars into wins soon. I understand that universities cannot be all things to all people in all areas and be exceptional at everything. You can't have the best nursing school in the country and also have the best finance school, and you, mm -hmm, you have mm -hmm. to focus in areas, of course. But at the same time, is there any indicator out there I know our buddy Tony Altimore comes on with his charts regarding all sorts of academic measurements and athletic and football budgets and success in all those fields. And I don't see where you can't succeed in those two avenues at the same time, athletics, i.e. football and various academic pursuits. Some of the best world-class universities are also great in athletics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the University of Michigan just won a national championship, like, you know, and they also have, I mean, they've been good at basketball uh, on both the men's and women's side. Gymnastics is a thing, swimming and diving. Uh, what's his name? Michael Phelps went to the University of Michigan. Just as one person, there are other Olympians and things like that. So, yeah, you can do both, but I mean, there's also a cost, you know, it's just, there's a balance that goes with it, is all. And along those same lines, uh, Falconer is saying, when Miami's top administrators want to win, we do. Facts, period. And, you know, we were able to kind of exploit um, exploit uh, the system. 
you know, or, or inefficiency in the recruiting game, you know, for a time uh, with Howard Schnellenberger and everything. And then, you know, as people kind of got hip to that game that, you know, kind of closed that gap. So it wasn't directly like spending that much, although he did have a healthy pipe budget because we know from the U when he went to the top recruits homes, he would, you know, talk in that little gravelly voice and then he would leave his his pipe on the the arm of the couch and everything and you know like oh my god coach Nellenberger you know he oh that's his and that, that reminds me of the University of Miami and, and things like that so um there, there there was a measure to that but and, you know and you know to his point you know Julio Frank you know the university president now um clearly heard Kirk Herbstreet when he excoriated Miami on game day a couple of years ago and we're putting our money where our mouth is but you know there still needs to be development on the field All right, folks, comments and questions. We will take them. Appreciate you being here. We're here every Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Eastern time. So make it uh, make it back and bring some folks with you. Uh, whether it's 2024 class, which is pretty much sealed, signed, delivered, all those things for just about everyone in the country. Although I did a run through the top 500 players the other day, and there were about 20 to 22 of them not signed. Now, most of them have made a hard commit here recently that would show that they are committed. But I would guess that there might be a few surprises here in the next week. Um, would Miami have a connection to anybody that could possibly slip in? I mean, it's possible. I haven't even really been looking at it because I don't think so. Um, but stranger things have happened. You know, we've gotten guys to commit late. You know, that was the the Mike Rumpf uh, special every year um, going down to, uh, you know, the end of the recruiting cycle and poof, he would, you know, fabricate a four-star cornerback from somewhere uh, that he would – he would get, and it was like, well, we didn't get, you know, Pat Sertan, who you, you know, uh, junior, who you coached in high school. We didn't get Tarvis McFadden, who you coached in high school. We didn't get all American. We didn't get Tyreek Stevenson, you know, like, da -da -da. I mean, I, he transferred from Georgia guys. Like he played two years up there. Didn't win that recruiting battle. It was just like, yeah, we didn't get those guys from down here or elsewhere, but we got this random four star from, somewhere else so i mean it's not the worst thing ever but not to the level that it should have been but um so I, I say that to say that yeah could it be possible yes it could be possible that miami adds a player or two um you know mario is always saying that we're looking to uh improve the roster at every position always which is uh you know what you should be doing for sure um, I, for my money, I would, ow, ooh, sorry, sorry. Y'all right? We good? Long story short, I sliced my hand open at band camp one year, and sometimes the nerves remind me that I sliced my hand open in the past. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, what was I saying? Oh, uh, talent acquisition. For my money, I would look and see at the spring transfer portal window more to see who we might be able to get that's game ready particularly a wide receiver and like i love having cam ward but god damn it you couldn't have done that 10 days before and get jeremiah smith you know what i mean like you, you couldn't have, like you wanted to play games and then i mean it's a it's a victory, but you know, almost at, I don't want to call it a full Pyrrhic victory because like we still have a team that we can take into battle, but like it's a victory and like both sides, I'm sure feel positive in the end. Like Cam Ward got the money that he was looking for and Miami gets the quarterback they were looking for, but like you, you lose the number one player in America because you're messing around. You know what I mean? Like it just, that w will always be a, a craw in my in my a thorn in my side, but so I say that to say that wide receiver is somewhere like number one wide receiver. Uh, there was another couple guys who were 
you know, Miami went a few guys that Miami went after at wide receiver, which has been unfortunately the the history in the transfer portal age. Like the top top guys that we've gone after, they've been like, "Cool, thanks for calling me. I sure might take a free visit down there, but I'm not going there because of your quarterback situation." Um, and if you look at just all the dudes who've transferred over, I mean, you had Zachary Franklin, you had uh, I'm sure that we kicked the tires on Tez Walker, you had Juice Wells, um, and even other dudes, you know. Uh, um, Jermaine Burton, like that was a guy who, if you don't remember way back six, seven years ago, was committed to Miami in his, the end of his sophomore year through his junior year. So this time as a sophomore in high school, when the seven on seven, uh, season started, Jermaine Burton committed to Miami. It was through the majority of his junior year. He was committed to Miami and then he flipped to Georgia. Right. So that's a guy I'm sure that we kicked the tires on. There's other dudes, you know, um, but no matter what we've tried to get a game ready dude at wide receiver, it's not born fruit. So that's somewhere I would look. Um, and then in the secondary, I would continue to look there. But unless one of these top, top dudes that's still available wants in, I would rather allocate it to transfer portal spring window guys. Um and who knows what those are going to look like? Because you know Michigan's window is still open. I know that a lot of the guys want to Sharon more, so they're probably going to stay. Um, but the other windows are still open from Washington and Alabama, and Boston College's window just opened because Jeff Halfley is going to the Green Bay Packers to be their defensive coordinator, as of uh, or reported like maybe an hour ago. Like I was literally playing video games, like waiting to come on here, and I saw that uh, Pete Thamel source report, and then it was hitting everybody. So uh, okay. and he's a guy who. Uh, went on the ACC network this week or last week, excuse me, and was talk, you know, talking negatively about the state of college football and recruiting and NIL and da 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 and and everything. And yeah, put in for the job at the Green Bay Pack. I'm sorry, it's got to be against the Packers or at the Packers because we got Ben Johnson coming back for another year with all the weapons we got on offense. Going to do numbers against you, buddy. Sorry for that, you know, twice a year, but I'm not really. But I mean, yeah, he was talking in in terms that were like. I don't really like it, and I would like to get out. And the Green Bay Packers were like, hey, how would you like central northern Wisconsin for your next spot uh, and to, to elevate up into the league? So he said, I will absolutely take that choice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how many dudes there are on Boston College's roster that I would want to go get, uh, particularly because I'm sure that uh, the, the positions of strength are – the same positions of strength that we have, like offensive line. But, you know, hey, that's another transfer window that's currently open. And then the actual full portal window opens again in spring. So um, short story long, that's where I would look as opposed to anything. If I'll put it to you like this, and I know I still got to write that Isaiah Thomas notebook. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Or rewrite it as it were. But if there's anything that happens next week, Wednesday, I will be playing catch up with notebooks. I'll put it to you like that. Corey Fleming, thank you so much for the 499. Appreciate you. Thanks for being here. 2025, three hard commits. Wade and Charles, wide receiver, Elijah Melendez, linebacker, Luke Nickel. Quarterback, quarterback not to put you on the spot because i know you have a cycle a calendar of okay. educating yourself and so forth but uh are you fairly familiar with these three if you looked at film oh yeah reports mm -hmm. i, I How do you actually feel about these three they uh sorry to cut you off there yeah because there's only the three of them and i was very interested to see like what the future looks like, particularly at quarterback, right? So I'm going to go from the top down. Like Wade and Charles, freaky athlete. He has, um, you know, big playability. This is a guy who could grow into, uh, you know, a, a two slash one receiver. Like he does uh, a lot on the field for Palm Beach Central. Um, Elijah Melendez, uh, they call him, you know, like a baby man almost. It, it's or big baby similar nickname to uh what Justin Flo had uh as a five-star recruit uh coming out uh Kasimi Osceola he's been down several times this is a guy that Miami loves and if you watch his film you will too he's a guy I mean Wade and Charles should be you know mid-high four-star uh based upon his talent 
um, Melendez, he will elevate. He's currently a three-star that will not abide. He's going to be, everybody's all American, you know, high four-star caliber dude. Um, trying to pair him like with the Tarvis TJ Alford at linebacker. There's another couple of dudes. Um, and Alford and Melendez are are friendly. So you see them tweeting back and forth. And Melendez is like, yo, like I'm coming to you, like br- big bro, come on down. Like, you know, let's let's hold it down, lock it down, all that together. So um, that's kind of a, a thing there. The one as of right now is Luke Nickel. And I was unfamiliar with his game. And he committed, and I'm like, man, I this three star from Milton, like he had, Milton, Georgia. Um, he had played some as a sophomore. All right, we'll see. He came down, they played a game against Davy Western. Um, which is not a great team, but they lost that game. He played okay, but not great. I think he was near 4,000 yards and 37 touchdowns with five interceptions across the year. I mean, he, it was a thing. I think after that Western game, when they came down, coach said, look, quarterback needs to lead the team and we're going to go as far as you take us. So are you about that life or are you not? And with his play, Luke Nichols said, I'm about that life, right? Colquitt County, top tier team. One of the highest ranked teams in the Georgia 7A playoffs, okay? That team led by Miami Hurricanes signee and early enrollee Nyquavian Nye Carr at wide receiver. Luke Nickel leads a come-from-behind victory in the state quarterfinals, beats Colquitt County on the road, and leads his team to a state championship. Not only that, and go look at the film, guys. 6'2", 2'10", kind of, you know, he's not huge, but, like, think Sam Hartman minus the baby fat. Like, that's kind of what his build is right now. Not not the biggest dude in the room. And, like, you know, again, when you got these basketball forwards in Emory Williams, 6'5", Jakari Brown, 6'5", and Judd Anderson, 6'7", in the room, he's clearly, I mean, he's half a foot shorter. You know what I mean? Well, five inches, whatever, same thing. But he, he moves well. He has good feet. He has a strong enough arm. It's not, he's not going to be confused with, like, a... Um, Jamarcus Russell, or what's the kid from Tennessee, Joe Milton. He's not going to get confused with having that kind of an arm, but he's a big enough arm to make all the throws. He's elusive. He can run. He can manipulate in the pocket, right, and throws dimes. And if you were watching on social this weekend, one of the biggest events on the 7-on-7 calendar, the first event of the 7-on-7 year, which is such a great just marketing and placement idea from battle when they saw looked at the landscape previously. Most of the tryouts for seven on seven teams, elite seven on seven teams, were around this time, end of January going into February. If you remember years and years and years ago, that's when Sean Burgess Becker and Calvin Ridley did that bullshit, got us out there on Super Bowl Sunday saying they were going to commit, floated it out there to myself and others, and I have the messages on my Twitter confirming they were going to commit to the University of Miami that day. I can name people that I was with who were still working in this industry, right? Like as professional, like full-time, I, I blog on the side, I make crumbs. Full-time journalists, I can name names of people who I am friends with who were there with me. And then they were like, oh, yeah, we'll let y'all know. Da, 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 da. And it was a it was a publicity stunt to get people out to that thing. But again, that was Super Bowl Sunday in that year. OK, battle look the battle company. So their their logo looks kind of like Nintendo, but it says battle through it. Uh, they do, uh, you know, football gear and accessories and everything. And they looked at that calendar and said, hey, if the first big events aren't until end of February, March. Why don't we make our event in January? Last weekend in January in Miami, get all of the elite teams from east of the Mississippi down here. You're going to get a couple from the West Coast because it's far travel, but that's when our thing is going to be. So all these teams converge. I say that to say that in the convergence this year was Luke Nickel playing for the Cam Newton All-Stars and dropped 
dime after dime after dime. Go search it up on Twitter, guys. So he took the challenge that I'm surmising came from his coaches during the season, elevated his play. Actually, I'm going to go on Max Preps, and I'm going to – I still have it saved because I was on there. Um, Where is it? Here we go. So when I say he elevated his play, in the first two games, a win and a loss, Luke Nickel had 184 yards and two touchdowns, and then 188 and one touchdown in the loss to Western, 14 to 10. After that, 241 on 70% completions and three touchdowns, 264 on 65 completions, uh, 65% and three touchdowns. Um, 266, 65, one touchdown in a loss to North Cobb. But, okay, 192 on 70% uh, completions, two touchdowns in a blowout. 138 on 77% completions, three touchdowns in a blowout. 457 on 73% completions and five touchdowns in a big win. 239 on 58% completions and two touchdowns. 294, 225, 298, 289, 430. Four against Grayson in the semifinals, four tutties and no interceptions, and then 205 on 76% completions in a state championship game win. Guys, he took that challenge, whether self-imposed or external, and I just read you the stats. And across that, he only had, get out of here, Aquaman, he only had five interceptions on the year. Three of them came in the playoffs. Two of them against Colquitt County, which was a two-point uh, two win, the game against Nykar and them. And then he had one in the state championship game. So the whole season until the playoffs, man's had two, uno, dos, un, deux, ein, zwei, interceptions across the year. Bro, this is a guy, and I saw somebody, a recruiting writer, write it. He said, hey, this might be the best recruiting win uh, that Mario Cristobal's had. And I know there are more impactful guys. Like you look in this recruiting class, five star here, five star there, five star here. Look back in last five star week went and da, 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 da. But with the way that Luke Nickel is trending up and the potential for his performance, because we went and evaluated and looked at him and said, we get that the recruiting sites have you rated as a three-star we and we're fine we see the vision offering you a committable scholarship and accepting your commitment now early he said huh and how early was it it was do 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 a week before my birthday august of uh august 11th there wasn't nobody who was on luke nickel like that but mara cristobal and shannon dawson the university of miami saw that vision early go look at the film if this kid sticks, because trust, there is going to be competition trying to flip him from the U. This could end up being, especially with the, the, the sport is so quarterback centric. I get that he's not the highest rated guy that Mario Cristobal has ever recruited or won that battle at the University of Miami. I don't know that I 100% agree with that writer who said that it's like the most impactful recruiting win or movement that we've seen from Cristobal, but it has to be on the short list. That's the kind of potential and performance we're seeing from Luke Nickel. Yeah, the offer list stands at 24, and it's pretty impressive because it starts out with a lot of solid Power 5 schools like Kentucky and Boston College and Duke and Cincinnati and so forth, but then pops up Florida State, pops up Louisville, Michigan State, Nebraska, Ole Miss. Uh, Lane Kiffin knows something about quarterback play. So you got to respect that. Uh, Penn State, Georgia, Wisconsin, Clemson. Yeah, yeah, again. And a lot of these, you know, they they did start rolling those offers out. Um, and he did first offer from Michigan State. You know, hey, good job, Sparty. Um, you know, he went to junior day at Florida State. Obviously, it's a regional school, you know, big school. Going to try to get out there. So, yeah, he got some offers, but – from the way that the recruiting went, it seems to me that those were the thing that Al Golden says does not exist, the non-committable offer or that camp or contingent offer. Like, yeah, we're giving you an offer, but the offer is contingent on you camping, we seeing you in person, working in our system with our coaches, da -da -da -da, those kind of things before we actually give you the full green light or whatever. Then 
you know, he Luke came down for unofficial in July. And after we offered him July 1st, came down July 29th last year and then committed in August. So like we the other teams were saying, yeah, we're gonna give you these, you know, maybe contingent that line said, hey, no, ain't no contingencies. Hop in a boat, let's ride. We're all in. Um, hopefully, you know, that relationship building pays off uh in the end. But yeah, of the three players, and again, this is why I can wax poetic for a while because there's only three. And I did just look at this film. But yeah, Luke Nickel, he's like in the three, but he ain't number three. Put him up at the top. Well, thank you, Leroy. Appreciate you. What wide receiver in the 23 24 classes will be the new X? Ray Ray Joseph. I mean, that's pretty simple. He's a technician in the slot, he's quick. And he's fast. Those are two different skills, guys. Um, you know, I think he's going to grow more into his role. He's going to be more confident this year. Um, you know, hopefully we get him in some space. Uh, you know, he's another guy. I mean, he's faster than X. He's quicker than X, right? So run him on those same routes. Run him on those, uh, you know, crossers. He's running away from safeties and linebackers. Run him on an option route and dare a defender to stay in front of him. With a, If he's coming out of the slot, and he has a two-way go, Ray Ray Joseph. What are you gonna do? You're not gonna cover him. You might hold him and get a pass interference or a holding call. But like, yeah, that that's the the easy answer right there. Ray Ray Joseph, another guy who can do similar things, being Nye Carr. Uh, Jojo Trainer can do similar things, but Jojo's gonna have to play on the outside, man. Cause like I since we didn't get J4, like it's really going to have to be that. But I think that there are multiple options. I say uh, Ray Ray Joseph being the number one, Nai Carr being the number two, but we have options who can step into that role uh, and be a consistent and uh, productive slot receiver, um, you know, and grow into that role over time. So that's where I would start my uh, conversation in terms of, you know, when they, but again, remember, I don't know if you saw Xavier Strepo is coming back for this season, by the way. So if you're like, oh, who's going to replace him because he's gone? Like, rip, run that back. No, he's not. So the, who's going to be X this year? X is going to be X. In the future, then you're looking at these other guys.